This is Bloomberg Equality. I'm Caroline Hyde. And I'm Romain Boston. Every Thursday this month, at this time, we're going to be taking a look at a wide range of topics highlighting what equality means for the economy, companies, and investors. We're going to focus on pride, and we're also going to focus on workplace diversity, environmental justice, and a potentially momentous Supreme Court decision. Today, Romain, we start with pride a time celebrated annually to honor the 1969 Stonewall riots right here in New York and the works to achieve equal justice, opportunity for LGBTQ people in the United States and across the globe. Now, over the next 30 minutes, we will dive into the importance of visibility, the leadership paving the way to inclusion and the economic realities for this very community. And a lot of that starts, well, right here with you and me, with media, with indeed how we're represented on television, on cable, on streaming. Yeah, it's so important. You mentioned the Stonewall riots and most of the protests, the ones that preceded that, and of course, the ones that came after that, a big part of it was about acceptance and really about being seen. Yeah, being seen, being heard, being understood, and then being able to re-celebrate, re-digest that every single year, as we do in the month of June. Yeah. And indeed, that not just be a United States conversation, a global conversation, too. Yeah, well, let's talk about what we do see on television, because I remember when I was a kid, you didn't really have that much representation out there, and what you did have wasn't always positive. But right now, those numbers have changed dramatically. About 12% of the characters right now on television across platforms are actually considered to be in that LGBTQ community. Yeah about 87 series now that have a main LGBTQ character and transgender characters are also getting their representation as well about 42 right now on television platforms across the globe and those numbers that growth remain is in large part because of the work of our next guest Sarah Kate Ellis glad president and CEO glad works through entertainment news digital media to share stories of the LGBTQ community that accelerate acceptance and just talk to us as having previously been a very senior media executive then moving to the world of GLAAD early 2014 when you took up the role what do you think the impact you made? Um, well when I started at GLAAD we didn't have marriage equality mm -hmm. so that was really the first thing that we needed to do when I was there was that was about telling the stories of couples of LGBTQ couples so that we could introduce the world to us and they could see that us getting married was actually a great thing for the country for the world at large and so it's progressed since then and I think in terms of representation in the media we've seen great growth and that's been phenomenal we need to see more growth though because it's still minuscule as compared to the rest of representation and we know how powerful representation is yeah. 80 percent of lgbtq youth say that when they see themselves or lgbtq people in storylines they feel way right. better about who they are we'll talk a little bit more about that representation because it's one thing to have growth it's another thing to have i guess positive growth or positive representation or at least representations that don't sort of hew to the stereotypes that a lot of us kind of remember from years past. Absolutely. We call that fair and accurate representation because it doesn't have to be joyful all the time. Mm -hmm. Although we do want to see more LGBTQ joy, uh, we need to see the struggles because those are real too. But it's about fair and accurate representation. And we've seen it increasing over the years. And like you said, we're seeing more trans representation, mm -hmm. more gender non-binary representation. A recent study that we did showed that 70, uh, close to 79% of non-LGBTQ people mm. want to see more representation of LGBTQ people because it helps them understand our I am, community. I am curious though, like when, as far as what they want to see, do they want to see people, I guess, I guess living the quote unquote LGBTQ experience or do they want to see, I guess what a straight person would say would be sort of the normal experience or is there some sort of distinction here that I'm blurring? I think, yeah. I think they want to see our yeah. whole selves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is us living in the world as we are. And yes, there's specialness to our community. Mm -hmm. But then again, we are the post officer. We are the, you know, now the Amazon car driver. We are the Uber driver. So we are everywhere. And I think that the richness of our stories and being told in all different ways is really important. Just like when you talk about cis white straight people right like we've seen them in every storyline possible yeah <laughs> right and i often say we want to see stories like you have experiences with lgbtq people 
You know people at work who are LGBTQ, in your family, at mm -hmm. your grocery store, in every intersection of your life. And that's where we should be in terms of representation. And let's talk about the sit cis white straight person who leads the media companies or is head of various streaming platforms or TV and when you go to them with your story your re writings the work that you've done with your wife about bringing up 13 year old twins and the books you shared how do you help them feel comfortable about being able to be more inclusive be understanding of your community and be wholeheartedly wanting to ensure that the right stories are told on their platforms well, that's a great question. And you know what? We work with corporates across the board in every industry, not just Hollywood. And I think what's really important is that we create a safe space to ask the questions about the community. And we have a whole program on education, on learning about our community, because it's changing. It's mm. moving. Like, you think about Gen Z and 20%, according to the latest Gallup poll, are LGBTQ or LGBT, excuse me. That is a big growth. That is year over year a big growth and, and over multiple years doubling. So they want to understand the community and want to grow and learn about the community. And that's the way we approach it. And we, we help them tell the stories that are meaningful and powerful. And that helps their bottom line in the end. And can I ask you, a relatively sensitive question, but that growth that you are seeing in mm -hmm. Gen Z, something that you understand as well as someone who is in very much more of a minority coming up through the generations mm -hmm. as a, a lesbian woman, how are, you, how are people experiencing that growth and understanding that growth in and of the numbers as well? The data is, is amazing. The data is amazing, and I think what's really important, I, I often compare it to being left-handed. When it was thought that Satan made you left-handed, nobody was left-handed. The numbers were minuscule. As soon as everybody realized, oh, you just write with your left hand, there's nothing wrong with you, you're not going to hell, all of a sudden the numbers tripled on who identified as left-handed. I think as we've seen acceptance grow in the world, and people feel safer to be their true and authentic selves. We've seen people identify as who they truly are. And that's really saving lives at the end of the day. That's less people harming themselves or taking their own lives and living their true authentic lives. What's the message that you would have for folks outside of the LGBT community? Maybe people who aren't necessarily uh, you know, advocating for the type of change you're advocating for, but then they see what's going on on television, they see what's going on in politics, and they just want to have a, maybe a better understanding of where they fit into all this. What do you have, what do you say to those folks? Well, I say we need as many allies as possible. We are under attack right now um, from politicians across the board, and our youth are really feeling it and seeing it. And so I say you learn, educate yourself. Go to glad.org, um, and we have resources there to educate yourself or ask somebody. And I always say if you, if, if you know somebody who's LGBTQ, it's all in the approach, you know, that it's coming from a true, authentic, curious place to learn and grow and learn about our community and then support us because you're in a lot of the rooms we're not in that you can help change this narrative and this conversation. Sarah Kate, it's been a great conversation. Thank you Thank for you. spending the time with us, sharing your story, your work. Sarah Kate Ellis, Glad CEO. Meanwhile, coming up on Bloomberg Equality, the LGBTQ pay gap. We dig into the economic ramifications of lower wages and the factors driving them. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. The economy itself is held back when people don't have the opportunities to be their full selves at work, to contribute all that they know and can do, their creativity, to, to our economy. This is Bloomberg Equality, and that was Lee Badgett, the author of The Economic Case for LGBT Equality, weighing in on the importance of inclusion. And there's some new data out there from the Human Rights Campaign that actually backs up Lee's case. It finds that workers in the U.S. who identify as LGBTQ, they face wage gaps across the board, Caroline. And remain 
stunning statistics, actually, that when you talk about LGBTQ, the people in the United States earning 10%, 10% less than average. And when you start to look at those that are Native American and black and also identify as LGBTQ, you're seeing the lowest earnings out there for that particular community. And I think what's really important is we talk time and time again of an economy that is slowing as we start to see a Federal Reserve looking to pull on the brakes, unemployment likely to rise, while it's this community that has higher rates of unemployment and indeed more food insecurity remain. All right. Well, let's take a look, did a little bit of a deeper dive into that data and the forces driving that data and bring in Bloomberg Equality reporter Kelsey Butler. Kelsey, thanks for being here. Uh, let's start off here with not only the wage gap, but more importantly, some of the causes, the structural issues that have been driving that gap. Certainly. So I think that we can't deny that discrimination comes into play here. That's something that the researchers that looked at this pointed out as contributing to this. And there's other research that shows um, out of the Williams Institute that one in 10 LGBT workers has faced discrimination at some point um, in the workplace. And that definitely um, makes a difference. And we also have the gender wage gap that plays into this um, too. you know, women that are part of the community as well. And that has been well documented and we reported on that as well. Of course, we've talked a lot about the inequality in the labor force, particularly for the black community. Talk to us about Native American, black, LGBTQ, how much worse they fare in terms of earnings power. Certainly. So what we see in the data is that when you're part of multiple marginalized groups, that effect just compounds. So uh, Native American members of the LGBTQ community are earning 70 cents on the dollar compared to an average, uh, the average worker. For Black members of the community, it's 80 cents on the dollar. So the effect just doubles and triples. It just compounds. Talk a little bit more about not just the wage issues here, but a lot of the economic insecurity that sort of gets folded into that. Food insecurity, something that Caroline uh, just brought up a minute ago. Certainly. So the Census Bureau did a look at this and looked at the um, how uh, LGBTQ people had been faring during the pandemic. And this was earlier um, in the pandemic. And um, a quarter of members of the community had lost some type of income since uh, during COVID-19. That's about 16 per that's above 16 percent for those that aren't um, in the LGBTQ community and also had higher levels of depression, anxiety, f food insecurity. And again, I want to emphasize that that was earlier in the pandemic. Now we're seeing inflation that is hitting so many people um, at in their checkbooks or wallets or what have you um, that is just compounding that effect uh, further. All right, Bloomberg uh, quality reporter Kelsey Butler there with a little bit of a closer look here uh, at some of the data about the wage gap and some of the other challenges that folks in the LGBTQ community face. But now there's a bigger question here about what impact does this have on the purchasing power of those folks? Joining us right now to discuss is Andre Najir. He's the CEO of the Pride Co-op, a 100 percent owned LGBTQ and operated marketing and consulting firm that helps brands like Apple and Disney connect with the community. Uh, Andre, look, I I've seen this with other minority groups over the years, whether it's uh, uh, black Americans, Asian Americans, women for that matter. There's always sort of this sort of moment where it seems like corporate America wakes up to the fact that, oh, why? These people buy things and they have money and they want to buy things. Give us some insight here into the buying power and more importantly, I guess, the growth of, I guess, what is still a minority community. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for highlighting our community. I think it's uh, especially important this year, given all of the legislation that's sitting on lawmakers' desks. Um, it is a tremendous um, uh, spending power, uh, purchasing power opportunity. Um, in fact, uh, we just released our 2022 report that looks at LGBTQ plus spending, and we're seeing an uptick from 1.2 trillion in the U.S. alone to 1.4 trillion um, in 2021. And globally, we're seeing very similar patterns. We're seeing anywhere from 3.5 trillion to 5 trillion in total global, global spending power. Um, this is the fastest growing uh, segment in the US today. Um, we're starting to see a similar pattern globally. Mm. And a big part of that, oh. No, 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 carry on, Andre. Yeah, a big part of what we're seeing is self-identification is increasing. And in a large part, we've got digital to thank for that. Um, some of the top performing channels on social media tend to be LGBTQ plus uh, channels on YouTube, TikTok. Um, so there's just a lot more visibility. But um, some of the statistics that we're also seeing is that despite 
the um, enormous spending power, we're seeing marketing spend capping off at only 1.8 to 2 percent. So there's definitely a huge white space opportunity wow. for companies. And what we do is we really help companies uh, connect with the community authentically. Talk about that. Talk about, say, the best practices, the recommendations you'd have for perhaps a marketing leader or indeed CEO of a CPG company that isn't LGBTQ but wants to be able to speak to a, a, a community, a younger generation that doesn't fall into the stereotypical boxes that we're used to. Absolutely. Well, first, we like to start off saying that we truly believe in inclusivity. So everyone should be at the table and we respect all other minority groups and all allies and non-minority groups. We think that that's a huge piece of bringing people together. Uh, but we do advocate for specific best practices. Um, and really, it starts internally with the team. Um, companies really supporting their employees from within, creating that DNA. Um, educating their employee bases on what LGBTQ plus means, providing protections, um, you know, and things that are ongoing throughout the year. Um, quite simply, you know, one of the best practices that we see is including LGBTQ plus creators in the process. So in addition to uh, team members and giving them a seat at the table, leveraging things like LGBTQ plus producers, directors, influencers, um, actors and campaigns and things like that. Um, and then no. uh, one thing that, that the community really advocates is just staying consistent year round. Obviously, right now we're in Pride Month and it's really exciting because a lot of companies are coming together for the community. But how do we keep that conversation yeah. consistent year round? Well, um, and then finally, giving back to organizations. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about the consistency, Andre, because every time Pride Month comes around, we see sort of the big corporate rollout of whether it's, uh, you know, rainbow colored Oreos or, or some other sort of product uh, where they just kind of stamp it well, with the rainbow color and say we support uh, a Pride. I, I am curious as to how you communicate with some of those companies that, A, they need to do more and more importantly, uh, that they do need to be visible 12 months out of the year. Yeah, I mean, first, it really starts with, you know, there's sort of the social action piece where companies are, you know, it's important to be social, to provide social good for various different communities. But there's also the financial piece. And what we do is we really try to underscore that we're a community that is growing. We're the fastest growing segment. We've got incredible spending power. Our household income is double the national average at 130000 for gay couples. Um, so we start there because we need to give, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we're speaking with businesses and we need to give them, you know, the reality that it's a profitable segment. Um, but then what we also do is we try to develop year-round strategies um, through things like LGBTQ plus influencers, uh, campaigns, digital marketing. And then again, it really starts from within. We do a lot of quarterly educational programs for employees. Um, I know that you had GLAD on earlier. They do that as well. So does the HRC. Um, so really what we do is we try to create an inside-out DNA just to make the connection authentic, yeah. which is really important to the community. Andre, I'm going to go into a sensitive topic to finish, but of course you started off this conversation by talking perhaps about some of the proposed bills from a state level that are aimed to quash a discussion about sexual orientation, particularly uh, and, and gender identity in schools, for example. We are in some time seeing the backlash to mm -hmm. ways in which to have this discussion. I'm looking at the Marine Corps, for example, the, the oh, ad yeah. or indeed the rainbow bullets that were put out for Pride Month. And, and this isn't about the political divide we continue to see. It's more about bridging those gaps. How do you do that mm. authentically without spurring anger in certain communities? Yeah, so I think you brought up, you took the words out of my mouth. I think bridging the gap, um, getting to know us. You know, I am um, and my team, we're much more advocates on communication versus fighting back. Um, so what we advocate is get to know us. And we do campaigns with a lot of different brands. Um, we work with Starbucks on What's Your Name, where we just sometimes hint at what it means to be uh, an LGBTQ plus person, to be trans. Um, I think that a lot of the backlash is simply due to lack of awareness. Um, again, I think digital is improving that. But quite honestly, a lot of people grow up with these mores and these values where they don't have exposure to the community. So what we try to do is invite. We definitely use much more of a connection strategy, and we found it to be very effective. All right, Andre, really appreciate you taking time uh, for the show today. Andre Najir there. He's the CEO of the Pride Co-op. Coming up here on Bloomberg Equality, global leaders, they're weighing in on the most pressing issues. We're going to hear what they had to say. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Equality, and right now we want you to take a listen to a few highlights from inclusion leaders across the globe weighing in on issues ranging from LGBTQ inclusion to Roe versus Wade to Aboriginal rights. You cannot divorce the past from the present, and I get very annoyed when people say, well, just get over it, get on with, get on with things. It doesn't work like that. Culture is on one aspect, but the willingness to change or incentive in a business to change is something actually to work pretty well too. So there are the two dimensions. The logic of Justice Alito's opinion doesn't stop with abortion. I definitely think that it has consequences, uh, potential consequences for many other rights, including the right that was most recently affirmed to marriage equality in the same-sex marriage cases. Uh, some of the many voices that we are going to be highlighting here on Bloomberg Equality. And if there's anything I'm sure of here, uh, Caroline, is that the world changes. It's mm -hmm. always changing. And it's important that everyone have a voice, maybe, in how that change occurs. And that we bridge those gaps, that we have an inclusive space for everyone, no matter how you've been brought up, what morals you've been thought of, and indeed a global conversation here. I think, if anything, corporate leaders, it's a feels dirty, but money can talk. Yeah. And when you see that there is $1.4 trillion mm -hmm. of spending power from a community that has been marginalized, how do you speak to that community? How do you engage with them? How do you ensure that you're being inclusive of them in your messaging? Yeah, and I think Andre really kind of hit on that point, the way you have to work with them to not only sort of use the right people in your campaigns, but to structure that campaign in a way that's not pandering and more importantly, consistent throughout the year and not just because it's Pride Month. Yeah, it's not yeah. about a month. It's not about a yeah. date. It's about a weekly conversation that we're going to be having having as well. And I think this is what's going to be so exciting. We're going to be continuing this very special coverage every Thursday throughout the month of June. And next week, the pressures on ESG, corporate leaders, regulators and investors all looking for a bit more. And we're going to discuss the future of the investing model. And then, of course, Juneteenth, equality in the workplace. And finally, of course, Roe versus Wade, a key topic that everyone has been discussing around boards and indeed at home. Yeah, a potentially momentous decision there. From New York. This is Bloomberg.